hi everybody forgive me for reading this but I didn't want to rely on my memory and leave things out it's been over eight months since I had my stroke and so now I feel ready to tell my story it was all too emotional to tell you everything when we first started our channel and still is to a certain degree that's why I've written it down to read to you so apologies for that and to the people who have been asking me the questions about my stroke over the months. It all began one morning when we were looking after the grandchildren. Rich had just gone to school, just done a school run with their granddaughter and then went to the local shops for milk. I was sitting at the dining table with my twin grandsons at my side in their high chairs they were a month away from their second birthdays. As I was eating my breakfast, I couldn't make out why I couldn't get the spoon to my mouth. I thought that I must have been sitting on a nerve. So I shuffled around the chair to try again. But no, I just couldn't get the spoon to my mouth. My mind was working overtime as to what it could be. And it seems to, seemed to be getting worse. I don't know how I knew, but quickly decided it was a stroke. I had no other symptoms at all. In fact, I felt quite well. I tried to act calm in front of the children. My mobile was upstairs and the house phone was in the other room. So I didn't think that I could get them as my right leg was beginning to lose its stability. I don't know how I managed it, but I got myself to the kitchen about five steps away to grab a pen and a piece of paper. I had no movement in my right arm by now and I am right handed, so I wrote quickly with my left. I'm having a stroke. My head was very clear and I thought, oh my goodness, Rich complains about not understanding my handwriting at the best of times, so I had to write so I tried to write it as best I could. Stroke. That done, I thought, right, I don't want to hit my head or on anything if I go unconscious. And I don't want to be, I don't want the boys to be frightened if my face went wonky. So I played a game of hiding from them on the floor until under their tables so that they could see my head. So they couldn't see my head. I thankfully didn't lose consciousness and it was only minutes before Rich came in and read my note which I had laid on my tummy. The rest of that day is a bit of a blur other than I was worried that they haven't given me any medication at the hospital but they said because it was a bleed they couldn't give me anything and they couldn't operate because the bleed was too deep in the brain. I do remember a doctor asking me what my preference for resuscitation was. It was so surreal. I kept thinking that they couldn't be talking about me. I'm not old. I looked at my son, who was the one beside me at that time, and I gabbled as best as I could and told him that I didn't know what to say. He spoke for me and said, yes, she does want to be resuscitated. I didn't want to be a burden to my family and visions came rushing back of when I had to turn my father's life support machine off. I looked at my son knowing he knew what I was thinking and he said, Mum, you or I can always change your mind. I decided there and then that I was going to fight it. Sorry. As I lay in that bed for days with no feeling down my right side and barely able to speak, I wondered if I would ever be able to buy the caravan we had dreamed about, having bought a deposit on it the week before my stroke. I thought I might look at YouTube for some inspiration. My other son had bought me a contraption that went on my phone and I learned to use my left thumb. So the first YouTube channel I came across was the Trudgeons. I joined them on their journeys and got caught up in their lives and adventures. 
This gave me the inspiration I needed to work hard at my rehabilitation. I showed the videos to Rich and he too got interested and gave him something to aim for too. Day after day, I would watch Dan and his family and kept visualising myself in our caravan. I also had a challenge set by my friend that if I could make it to my birthday bash weekend in December, he would buy me a bottle of champagne. I worked so hard to get out of that hospital and when I arrived at home I was greeted in my dining room with boxes and boxes of stuff. It was everything Dan had suggested to buy or build. It was like Christmas. I think Rich got a little carried away. I wrote to Dan and jokingly said for him not to give Rich any more ideas. In Dan's New Year video, he asked people in the caravan community to grab a camera and create a vlog. So, of course, we did that too, and that's where our YouTube channel videos began. So that is my story, and I hope by sharing it, I can inspire other people to never give up, even when you hit rock bottom. It's such hard work, but it's so rewarding. Now I'd like to give you my Oscar speech and would just like to thank a few people. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my family, my friends, my physios who have shown incredible patience, love and kindness, especially Rich who is my rock. To all the YouTube community whose wonderful comments inspire me every day but mostly to Mr Dan Trudgeon who has no idea how important he was to me in my darkest days. I really can't thank you enough Dan even though you have cost us an absolute fortune over the last eight months. So don't forget to keep smiling because being positive you can, can carry you through no matter what. So keep smiling. Bye.